I am thrilled to introduce Sine Ford, who is a scholar and a, a senior research scientist at Microsoft Research. Uh, she received her PhD from North Carolina State University and does work at the interaction of social computing and software engineering and has published a bunch of stuff in both places. A lot of her work focuses on barriers to participation in sort of coding communities, cognitive and social barriers. Um, and I've been following her work for a few times uh, and have uh, had the pleasure of seeing her present uh, at a couple of conferences and I'm really excited that she's uh, here to talk to us. Um, oh, I should also mention uh, that uh, she's uh, that uh, she's a, a affiliate professor in the assistant professor in the at the University of Washington um, as a way of sort of unfairly taking credit for some of her uh, excellent work, I think. Um, but in any case, a uh, uh, longtime follower and pretty excited that she's uh, here today and very excited to um, hear this talk. So please take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Mako. That was a really great intro. Is that part of the recording? Because I need, that was cute. Um, but hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I'm Danae. Um, a lot of my talk, I really intentionally structured it to follow what Regina was already talking about earlier. Um, and in some cases, I'm going to be diving a little bit more specific into some of the developer experiences. Um, so I guess we can consider my portion of today about building empowering developer communities. So how do we empower the builders of communities, the maintainers of communities to keep them sustainable and keep them going? Um, okay. And I also plan for this talk to be a bit more interactive. So, and I'm trying to make sure I can see you all at the same time. Um, so feel free, what I hope you have people do is just come off mute because it's easier for me to kind of just have people yell at me than me trying to track in the chat. In the chat. But I wanted to start off by making sure people were paying attention. So don't look at the notes, but does anybody remember what LPP stands for? People who don't already use it in their work, maybe. Legitimate peripheral participation. That was good, Justin. That was good. Yes, hand class for Justin, for sure. So yeah, that was a uh, legitimate peripheral participation. Um, and Regina talked a little bit about this from Lava and Winger, but um, you'll find that a lot of people studying online communities are really drawing theories on or drawing from a lot of these theories around how smaller offline communities are practiced and they're building, they're bringing them into online settings and figuring out how to make the offline in the online make sense. And in a lot of these situations, people are drawing again from what are the interactions that are helpful for people to engage in learning. Um, one of those is mutual engagement, which Regina kind of hinted at, alluded to a little bit earlier, where people are learning by also watching others engage. Um, and I think we started to hit a little bit about that in the chat, the beauty of having some of these private spaces where people are already in the same interest area um, rather than the broader scope, where it's kind of hard to identify who those people are. So most of my work uh, will be about how developers engage. So I focus on a specific type of community of practice. Um, or a specific type of socio-technical ecosystem. I'm not going to be doing too much jargon um, as best as possible, but if there's things that are confusing, we feel free to raise a hand uh, and, and jump in and ask questions. Um, so I'm mostly focusing on online programming communities, and I was looking at the notes doc, and it looks like quite a few of you are also familiar with open source communities. Um, so maybe we won't need to dive into it as much, but I have content here for the few that aren't as well. Um, so I mostly look at, or prior to joining Microsoft Research, I did a lot with Stack Overflow. Um, and looking at their mentorship program or their first mentorship program where we had over 70,000 novices engaged. Um, and we learned a lot about the beauty of some of these private spaces and people transitioning their questions that they got feedback on to public spaces. So I'm also happy to talk a lot about that. I was able to, while Regina was talking, I was able to pull up some of my dissertation slides. So I can also actually, I do have some things I can show now. Um, if those come up in conversation, I'm happy to share them. They're also somewhere on the internet. Um, but for the purpose of most of today's talk, I'll be talking a lot about GitHub, um, which is this home for developers. And I kind of saw a couple of screenshots of that for folks who aren't as familiar. Um, so first couple examples of developer communities I mentioned before. before. Um, Stack Overflow is one of the larger ones. And the reason that I, I think people hear about um, Stack Overflow, but may not also realize that there's also a broader Stack Exchange community full of 
um, a tons of subcommunity centers around math, travel, um, LaTeX, statistics, literature. Um, so for those who are not as familiar, the, this is an example of one of the 23 million questions as of June, no, as of September 25th. And then this is an example of one of those 34 million answers of same similar date. Um, I think I had some stats that there are about over 18 million users now. Um, there's about 87 million comments that kind of can't really see at the bottom of the screen here. Um, and there's 64,000 tags. So there's different peripheral information that people get from these posts that kind of indicate how to find their subcommunity, whether it's by the tags here, um, engage in different dialogues from their from their comments. So what I'm describing right now is like different context we can extract from these forums that allow us to understand maybe how people are refining their subgroups in different ways, even before official subcommunity tags are available, official subcommunity spaces are available. They're forming these um, these spaces on their own. So I look a lot of that. I look a lot at like how people do that on their own and then figure out from there what can we build on platform um, at scale. Um, for those who are never are familiar, uh, one of the other communities I look at is GitHub. So this is an example of a project little window, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and here you can see a lot of different peripheral information. You see the description of the project. There's not as many tags listed about the project's topic on this one, but you can see different contributors, information about the languages as well. Um, I just wanted to also again, give people an idea of the type of information that's available in these communities. So, oh, I don't know if I highlight this on the last slide, but you can also see the different types of people who are contributing. Um, you can click on their profiles and see where they're from. Um, the primary contribution and the traditional primary contribution to some of these communities has been just code. So people only look at the code, but there's so much additional uh, ways to contribute. So there's non-code contributions that are just as valuable. People who triage issues, um, people who engage in discussions, which is now the social Q&A um, aspect of GitHub, where people can previously have those conversations on Slack, they're having them on, on the platform now too. And so this is an example of an issue which where people can um, uh, identify bugs or different uh, features that need to be built. And you can see people actually engaging the dialogue around them as well. We use this information in a couple of the studies that I'll show later. So I just kind of want to give a little bit more context around when I start describing them, what they're for and how people use them. But one of the bigger issues that uh, I've been investigating lately is around how open source can be more sustainable. Um, there are tons of open source software developers who are burnt out. Um, the maintainers who operate these large software projects, which large companies like Microsoft and others do depend on, um, they're at their wit's end. Um, so a lot of the internet's core software technologies, they rely on open source. Um, and when these systems or these tools aren't maintained uh, effectively, the repercussions can have a lot of downstream effects. Um, but the issue is a lot of these maintainers aren't funded as um, as they wish to be, as they should be. And there's also not a lot of um, incentive to keep them engaged as much anymore. They're losing different, their motivations have been shifting um, as well as because how people have been using some of these systems have been shifting as well. So um, a lot of, again, a lot of the reasons why I'm looking at developers per se is because they are the builders of these complex systems. Um, they have their own subcommunities that they rely on when they're trying to build these tools. So I look a lot about how they're navigating these communities as a resource um, and also how they may be empowering one another or empowering more people to become developers. So I have a quick discussion question here or discussion break here, which really when I wanted to take a pause and have people think about, you know, what does it mean to build empowering communities? Regina talked a lot about different feedback structures and how they're helpful and how people have been using communities of practices intentionally. But I'm curious, when you all hear um, building empowering communities, what is what stands out to you? What do you think it takes to do that? And I can't see the chat if anyone is typing. Oh, Justin has their hand up, Justin. I guess one thing that stands out to me from this last conversation is is safety, having safe places where people feel empowered, where they can speak up and be a part of the community. 
over. Absolutely. Having mechanisms to keep people safe or for them to feel safe is really important too. Um, because when they're safe, they feel more vulnerable. I mean, asking this, the quote unquote silly questions, um, the questions that other people are thinking but may not be feel as empowered to ask or, or unable to ask. So thank you for sharing that, Justin. Building off that, Pranav said spaces that encourage self-expression in the chat, which I think Absolutely. is great. Absolutely. Um, and I'll also add like places where it's okay to be wrong or make mistakes. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I can see the chat now. Okay. Perfect. Sacco flu has a reputation to be in a harsh place. Absolutely, Ned. That is a hundred percent correct. Um, these are all these are all great perspectives too. Mako, Mako, you have your hand up. Oh yeah, yeah. I was thinking maybe like a like a, a place where people feel like I don't know. I think it was something like like self efficacy, where people feel like they can make a difference, um, where they can where they can accomplish their goals. That's awesome. That's this make a difference point. I'm going to ride that coattail for a bit. Thank you also for sharing the chat uh, all as well. I see Kat has something about a strong shared purpose. Absolutely. I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about how. Oops. Can you all no longer see my screen? I can fix that. Okay. So I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about how developers are finding their uh, shared purpose or, you know, how they're trying to empower communities and themselves and their broader communities around them. So many of you are already familiar with open source communities and traditionally people think a lot um, about open source software tools like TensorFlow, React.js, which are really empowering for developers. Um, but however, for a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about or kind of shifting you all to think about um, are the projects that are a bit more galvanizing um, and have broader impacts that inspire developers to contribute to a broader societal goal. Um, so a couple of those projects you can see on the slide here. One of them is a uh, little window, which I showed a little bit of the GitHub project for earlier, which is a project that helps victims of intimate partner violence find safe resources or resources to leave uh, challenging scenarios. Um, another open source project is Refuge Restrooms, which helps non-binary, trans, um, and folks across the gender spectrum find restrooms that are safe for them, that they feel comfortable in. Um, and another one I highlighted here on the right is a project that a couple of developers or a group of developers have created to help victims or refugees from Ukraine and Russia find resources to leave, again, very conflicting uh, regions or to find the resources to find their families. And I think these are great examples of how developers have been really trying to use their technical skills to support a broader societal goal. And these are um, something that we've been, with these types of projects we've been coining as open source software for social good. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the next steps that have followed some of these projects, but I won't talk about the core project per se. Um, there's links there at the bottom of the slide for this paper that we presented a few years back um, in 2021. And these, I have a set of resources that I can share broadly about the initial project as well. And I'll post them in the in the slides later as well too. Um, one thing that's really interesting to highlight about these more galvanizing projects where developers are really trying to gather their skills to support a broader societal issue is that there are a range of ways that people are seeing how they can have this impact and this proximity to impact. Um, so for some of the work we were doing, we were extracting from Construal's levels of proximity um, or, or distance. Um, and we were looking at how these spatial proximity, temporal proximity, and social proximity make it uh, shift how people look at projects they find valuable to contribute to. So when I talk about spatial proximity, I'm talking about where people see if this is an issue that impacts the world, um, like, for example, COVID-19, the pandemic, versus things that support their local community, their actual neighborhood, for instance. So like tracking local health issues, like the forest fires that are happening in the Pacific Northwest right now. Um, as well as looking at different factors such as the temporal proximity, as in is this is my contribution going to be helping a long-term issue, it's like global warming, or more of a, a short-term issue at the time, or more of a quick ephemeral type like uh, floods, floods watch. So think about the flooding that's happening in you know Florida, for instance, right now because of the hurricanes. 
Um, so even looking at the difference between who is impacted or how the people in their personal community of people they trust, their private safe space of people may be impacted by an issue can also really increase their interest or uh, galvanize them more around a topic. So the personal connections they may have, such as their social proximity, like with their best friend being impacted versus a stranger they walk by on the street. So I think these are all different ways to think about impact, but also they shift how we think about the value of private spaces and what we get out of them that we may not be getting in the same way out of these broader communities. So I'm hoping to maybe discuss more about that later too. Um, but although I mentioned a couple of these open source for social good projects, they are fewer in quantity and but very powerful in influence. So the bigger issue is they also face the same broader open source challenges of uh, maintainers burning out. They're not being enough resources to support them on their projects. So they face the same issues of how do we think, uh, how we should keep them sustainable. So to think through this or to really try to tackle this issue, we've been building on some of the initial open source for social good work where we identified the motivations and challenges and when to think of these different work streams of how we can, or different approaches we can take to attack this problem uh, to help sustainability. So one of them, one perspective is looking at the project owners um, and their skills. So how project owners identify skills of contributors um, and that what skills are then necessary for them to contribute to their project. Looking at how maintainers, how we can support maintainers and give them the resources they need to be able to support their communities. And then the contributors, the people who are actually writing the code and contributing to the projects, which is also goes beyond code because they're experts from beyond software development, such as environmental engineers, um, policy uh, officials who are also contributing to these projects in non-code uh, approaches and ways. So we want to be able to think about how are we keeping things sustainable or thinking about sustainability from these perspectives. For the first one around project owners and identifying skills, we had a project we shared about uh, a year ago where we identified skills of contributors in projects. And I'm really using the word contributors here on purpose because they're more skills than just writing code, right? There's, are you able to teach others? Are you able to be a great collaborator? I mentioned a little bit about how there are contributors who have who are experts, but in different fields. So we wanna make sure we're creating a space where, especially in these social good projects, where they're able to contribute and their skills are valued and recognized so that we can continue to bring in, uh, attract and retain that type of talent. In this tool we bit called, built called Disco, which I won't really talk much about, but um, you can read more about online. And here's the link to information and a quick 10 minute video about the project that the, my intern Jenny T. Leong worked on. Um, what we were able to find out is that we were able to identify the skills or the presence of some of these skills. So this would be technical skills, social skills, communication skills, um, and additional uh, perspectives. We were able to recognize these skills with 77 to 97 percent precision. I also want to acknowledge that for the open source for social good projects, this is a very niche type of project um, for our setting. So we were able to kind of build on what's appropriate and it's easier to kind of identify what's specifically necessary for this community because we were being that specialized. Um, so I, do, I want to emphasize that. And I can also talk about the advantages to doing that and also the disadvantages of doing that, um, as well as people think about what makes sense for their community. Um, we were also able to acknowledge that or find out that a lot of people were interested in sharing these high proficiency scores, so skills that they were actually had A pluses in, essentially, on their profile. So thinking about ways we can also demonstrate people's expertise in a way that is um, honoring their values, but not also leading to gamification, right? So again, I'm really trying to think of different ways we can avoid gamification, but allowing people to kind of share and acknowledge their expertise in ways that allow the community members to be able to identify them and point them to the projects that make sense for them. Another project, uh, another pipeline I was talking about earlier were maintainers. So Miriam Guzani, who was another intern from uh, two years ago where we looked at how to support maintainers through building a dashboard. Um, how do we help them or reducing their load for projects or their load of requests they get from contributors as well as project owners um, who are also not a part of the actual open source uh, process. So I already talked about this earlier, but maintainers are overloaded. And how do we, how are we able to build tools that maybe can decrease this load, but also empower them to empower the next generation of developers? So to do that, 
we really dove into and looked deeply at how people were already using some of the tools that were already available on GitHub. Um, so we were specifically looking at GitHub maintainers or how what avail was available on GitHub because I'm partnered with GitHub right now for a lot of projects. And I could talk about how that's been helpful as well too. Um, so after we were looking at some of the platform resources and tools they have, we noticed that the GitHub Insights dashboard, this tells you a lot about the project, was pretty empty. Um, so to do that, once we realized what wasn't there, we were trying to figure out what we can provide maintainers to reduce their loads. So we built this broader dashboard here on the left hand where we're able to provide insights as in data insights um, about who's joining the projects, where they're going, how long they're staying in the project, as in where they're contributing to as well. Um, and then that later informed the GitHub's new community insights dashboard where you're able to identify what type of metrics are valuable for maintainers. And I want to talk a little bit about how we did that in case there's other open source maintainers on the call who want to figure out how they can do this for their specific communities. Um, to do that, we kind of took we had a, a multi-step approach. I only talk about a few of them um, here, which is the first one, which is building this conceptual model. So we wanted to understand about what the goals of different open source projects were across different stages. So there's um, there's different size projects based on who's contributing or what, how early on in the process they started. And there's also ones who are really trying to grow contributors as in attracting newcomers intentionally to get them to just have their first contribution and later contribute to some other open source project. And then there are some projects like, um, like the Open Source for Social Good ones, which are very specific about trying to nurture a resource that others will use and be dependent upon. So they need a continuous influx of not just new contributors, but contributors that will stay and be active um, and then rotate into new maintainers eventually. For the purpose of the project I'll be talking about today, I'm going to highlight some of the ones around newcomer friendly issues and how to attract uh, newcomers and then also how to retain them, how to give them and honor their honor their contributions so far so they can feel like valued members of the community and grow and then also nurture them to be later maintainers. But we'll stop here for that one. So after we built this conceptual model by building on a lot of prior literature about how people have investigated open source communities, also connecting with a lot of our open source maintainers um, through the, through GitHub, we have different projects like Next.js. We have a, like a resource of different communities that we've been able to ping and ask about how they have been trying to build tools for themselves and also what type of insights they're not getting from platforms that would help reduce their load. So for this part of the project, we ended up doing for the social good maintainers, uh, interviewing about eight maintainers and asking them a lot about their activities, their goals, and again, feedback on the maintainer dashboards that would be helpful for them. So what we did actually was built dashboards for each individual maintainer. Um, and I'll show what that looks like. So we built what I showed you on the previous slide, um, but was really bespoke to their types of contributors, um, where their goals were heading, as in what type of stage of the project they're in and figuring out what was most valuable for their specific use case. In this maintainer dashboard, we were able to, again, focus on what attracting and what retaining look like. So for the attract perspective, we were looking at the project growth recommendations. So how do you grow a project? How do you attract people who are interested in these same goals? So in order to do that, we noticed, like I showed you on the uh, little window project earlier, there were no descriptions or tags um, listed there. So we wanted to be able to provide those attributes or recommend those attributes that people or maintainers should be adding to their project. Um, so we followed the sustainable development goals and we wanted to align which projects had actually been trying to be successful at one of those goals. We also looked at ovo.org, which is a place where contributors can identify projects worth contributing to, as well as ones centered on social impact, technology impact, and you can find around different pillars that are, that are not quite the same as sustainable development goals, but we won't get into that right now. Likewise, for project recommendations, we were looking at the issues list. So did they have, uh, did they clearly identify which contributes, which issues were great for first-time contributors? Did they have good first issues there? For the community growth recommendations, we wanted to figure out how, again, they could be retaining those new contributors who are actually active um, and actually wanted to participate. 
So we've been able to recommend this rising contributor badge and also provide additional detail about who those people are who have been contributing, how long they've been active, when they joined, so that they can, so the maintainers can be able to understand what time period has been most helpful in growing this community. So this is an example of what the project growth recommendations look like here. When on the left side panel here, which is maybe a little bit challenging to see, you can see that for the newcomer, for each recommendation, which you can see at the light bulb here, we provide how, what information we use to make this recommendation, as in where, what context did we grab to make this recommendation, what the recommendation is, as in, and how it would be helpful. Because I think that using Toolman's arguments for, um, for, for structure have been really helpful in understanding how developers should be engaging in other settings. So we looked at Toolman's arguments for um, debug messages before, or for error messages, compiler error messages before. We wanted to figure out if we can use the similar context of like, tell me what's broken, tell me how you got that information, and then tell me how to fix it. Really being, keeping things as simple as possible can be helpful to maintainers because they're already overloaded There's a lot of um, overhead of tasks they have to be doing. So we wanted to keep it really simple. Um, and I'll briefly talk about some of the feedback we heard from newcomer friendly issues and from the other dashboard recommendations, but I won't dive in too much because I want to make sure we have enough time for discussion and I really liked where the discussion was going before. So overall for the newcomer friendly issues, we did see that they were really helpful or recommendations on where to add newcomer friendly issues were helpful for those projects who were trying to attract newcomers. Um, but another big issue that they highlighted to us was that there's a time and a place in their stage of projects where they want newcomers to join. For example, October is Hacktoberfest, where uh, a lot of new contributors or new to open source overall people are trying to find those projects that are uh, that they have the ability to add value to. But maintainers aren't always looking for that value for new contributors the entire year out. So we wanted to be able to, it was really helpful to be able to know when to add those types of uh, recommendations and badges to the projects. For the social good uh, badges here, um, we did see that maintainers found it really helpful um, to make their products more visible. So when you add these tags to their projects, they're able to kind of get promoted uh, to the search through search. So currently at the time, there's no way to really search. There's no recommendation on GitHub's platform to add the tags to your project. But if there are people interested in finding your project and interested in finding societal impact projects, you want those who are also galvanized around the same task or around the same public societal issue. So you, in order to find those people who are interested in having this type of impact, they find they maintainers acknowledge that this will be very valuable to kind of have highlighted there as well. Oops, I think I skipped too many slides. Um, no, I'll skip those. Okay. So as far as community growth recommendations, I think this is probably the one that a lot of people gravitated towards the most because it provided them with insights that they didn't have per se. Because before this, a lot of the mechanisms people were using to track their projects were offline. They weren't happening on GitHub. You know, they were tracking based on who was engaging in the chats on, on Jitter. Um, and Slack and other platforms like that. So for our community growth recommendation here, what we did was acknowledge a six month window from the time we conducted our study to six months before, which is 2021, Jan 1 to uh, the end of June, we were able to kind of start looking at who had been actively contributing since then, who had joined the project, uh, what types of activities they were doing, which you see on the other page, I'll go back to that. And then also who stayed throughout. So the blue line here at the top indicates who's been active in that month. The green one looks like who's, who's, at, who, who's been retained or how many contributors have been retained during this time period. And then who's joined, as in who are the newcomers who've joined in the project, which is this orange color here. Other information we provided was who these individuals are, as well as what types of activities they were engaged in. So who was submitting issues, who was submitting pull requests, who was actually committing code, or just maybe even updating markdowns, for instance. And this was actually really helpful because we were able to give maintainers insights 
and under help them understand what their peak and non-peak times of the years were. Um, so, I, for example, having a crash in May seemed to make sense. A lot of folks went on break. Um, students, if their students contributing to their projects, students are also starting to no longer be as uh, primarily focused on open source, but maybe primarily focused on their on their schoolwork. Oh, I guess I removed this quote. We also had a quote that was uh, I didn't have it on the slide, but it was actually really helpful at uh, understanding what roles some people have and if they're actually doing the roles they've been recommended to do. So here, I don't know if you see this kind of small, but one of our contributors here has only been submitting issues. There's no pull requests from them, no commits. But that's expect that was actually expected. So there are people who have been recommended to have these rising contributor roles, maybe not the same as what the badge we have here yet, but these were folks who were trying to really be intentional about how they wanted to contribute to a project. And their goal was to triage issues as they came in. So maybe there were comments that came up on Slack or other forums and they wanted to make sure they were getting translated into actual to-do items, into issues. So that was really helpful for maintainers to be able to understand what's, who are those specific people in those roles and also help them think about the different types of rising contributors or rising maintainers on that should be joining the project or engaging in the project. So I talked a lot about a different sets of recommendations on the help project growth, as well as help them grow their community of contributors. Um, and I'm curious from you all, we may, what are some other types of recommendations that you may you think may be helpful to kind of reduce the load for the maintainers? There's a, another overview of projects or from the from the different work streams I was mentioning before, with how do we help contributors find projects um, that are meaningful, um, that allow them to connect with the open source for social good projects that are ones that align with their interests. I'll talk a little bit about a tool we built to do that, um, but I, maybe not as much because I think I'd rather have a discussion broadly, and then we can just I'll, I'll show a couple of resources of where people can read about the tool, and then we can talk more. Okay, so there's a, building on some of the other previous recommendation tools. Um, there's tools that Mozilla has, such as CodeTribute, which helps people find uh, first code contribution opportunities based on a set of topics, as well as Scott Hanselman and others have really built this first timers only way to find good first issues or first time opportunities for novices to open source and then later on novices to specific projects to contribute and add value. They're also really helpful for um, being able to connect with others from similar interests, as in, again, these sub-communities of interest. And I see Mako saying something about ripping off some of the ideas of mentoring, for sure. So there are different, you're able to kind of find contributors based on your similar interests, but that depends on how often you, or how meaningfully you engage in those projects. Um, in any case, we wanted to build a recommendation tool that was bespoke, bespoke upon the language, so the programming languages you're familiar with, the interests that you have, the social ties, connections you may have to the project or the project owner, as well as the recency, um, as in how, uh, how up to date is this project, how active is this project. So in our broader recommendation tool called Reebok, which is recommending bespoke open source software to contributors. We were able to take into a lot of information about commit history, product description, um, and commit activity, understand the different language profiles and interest profiles of contributors based on their prior projects. And again, for this work, we're focusing open source for social good projects. Um, and from there, be able to have the signal scoring um, algorithm that we use to identify and compare or pair people with projects or really it was recommending projects because it was more of a recall experiment where we were looking at what projects they look, have contributed previously, what open source for social good projects they had contributed previously and seeing what factors essentially we were able to uh, identify were important in how they identified that project. Again, we use OVO's social impact, list of social impact projects, um, the Digital Public Goods Alliance as well, which was kind of commissioned by the UN Secretariat and figured out which projects aligned with the different 17 sustainable development goals. So it's a lot of acronyms, so I won't say 
probably that much often. Um, but we use, I'm going to use some machine learning uh, language to be able to describe this, but we did not do any fancy machine learning here. Um, we use our training data of 292 contributors and projects and then compare that with our test set of 432 projects from the OVO, like projects that were also listed in OVO.org and the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Again, these are projects based on our previous open source for social good um, study where we identify the motivations and challenges. So really using that same set. And I will click through that real quick. But one thing I want to highlight that was really helpful for us recommending or identifying projects that were aligned with each individual person. Again, we looked at language, interest, social tie, and recency separately. And then we combined, look, we started looking at the combined or cumulative signals. In the bottom, I won't, I won't break down everything here on this graph because I don't think it's as important, but we looked at our top hits as in if we had a, rec we had a list, a ranked list of recommendations, we look at the top five, top 10, top 15, top 20 to make sure the projects that they actually contributed to were actually listed in our set of projects. Um, and from there, we see that recency as in how recent or how active the project was, was actually very valuable and helpful in identifying um, whether or not a contributor uh, was engaging on that project. Uh, between recency and then social ties and the proximity to the owner, have has this contributor contributed to similar projects from this owner before? Um, have they also been in other projects with similar contributors before as well? From our prior work, we knew that that trust in who the owner of the project was was a large, is a impactful factor in deciding whether to contribute to open source projects. So we're happy to see that was consistent here. And I could talk a little bit about what that means as well. If there's different questions about owner versus uh, an owner being an entity like Microsoft or an owner being an individual grassroots project. We also conducted a brief formative study um, where we have uh, individuals where we compared, once we identify their projects, we wanted to ask them about uh, how how on par were we for this relevant project? So we compared a project that was uh, that we did successfully identify and one that we did not. So we went to compare to make sure we didn't have any false positives. And what we learned was that a lot of these contributors were strongly driven by learning, um, also strongly driven by the primary goal of the project, so the societal impact goal they were trying to hit. Um, as well as who was also contributing to that project and wanted to break up the monotony of contributing to the same type of project. For instance, if I'm building something towards um, that's usually helping people with intimate partner violence, I don't want to keep building chatbots that are um, that have been able to find or support this issue because I've done that before. I'd rather switch up, a, have my technical skills be devoted towards a different goal. Um, and learn new skills on the way while doing that. So that's an example of being driven by learning um, and being wanting to shift the type of impact that you're having, but still grow skills. So um, the project takeaway, I talked a little bit about some of those, uh, how we were able to identify the projects with our highest of the 63% hit rate, which was the recency um, figure I showed on the far right. Um, and then we also, gave us a lot of questions about what we should be, what we could be automating, what we should be automating, maybe what we shouldn't be because we don't have enough information on that yet. So having a, a combination of what we were saying of this automated and human verified recommendations that can scale is something that is very interesting to us um, and figuring out what that looks like in partnership with maintainers, in partnership with contributors, in partnership with the project owners to figure out what is actually reasonable based on their project goals and what, so if your goal is to attract newcomers or to not attract newcomers as what Ned, Ned may be, would be one of the goals that Ned was mentioning as well. A big project question or open question that we're hoping to explore moving forward is something that I've probably been speaking out a lot more about is um, recommending projects that may be safe. Um, I think we talked a little bit about this for Regina's project, but people who are contributing to some of these social good projects, if there are around topics that may be conflicting in the political sphere, the people who are contributing to these projects publicly are also at risk, right? Their, their information is publicly available. People can see who they are and which projects they're adding to and may be tying them to different political challenges. So they, how do we also think about how do we keep these types of contributors safe? Um, maybe this is also 
cost to have some of these projects be a little bit more private initially and we operate in more of our private settings when we're dealing with more um, societal or politically charged projects. Um, beyond that, how do we also think about keeping um, contributors overall beyond social good projects? How do we keep think about keeping those contributors safe? And what does it mean to have a safe open source project? We talk about codes of conduct, but how do we enforce them? What does enforcement look at scale? Um, I think Pranav was starting to also, well, Pranav was mentioning something that made me think about that earlier as well. So these are things we're interested in, in, in investigating. Um, so I recommend folks, if you're interested in uh, any of those works in depth, I they're all listed on at aka.ms slash OSS for SG. And all, all, all of the, the things I linked have been, can be found there. Um, um, I like to, there's this broader question I have about what does it take to build empowering and sustainable development communities? Um, and I have a list of things I think it will take. I like to kind of pose these as opportunities because like research, um, research opportunities that I think we still have yet to investigate. Um, really full strong feelings around safety. I don't think we talk enough about that. Um, I think as more developers come into uh, as more develop the rise of developers increases as we start to increase the next generation of developers, I think there are different topics around keeping them safe, protected, so they can feel like they're doing their best work. Um, I don't think we do have enough mechanisms around that, so I think it's important that we that we think about that. Um, and with that, I'll close. I have a set of open discussion topics or questions, but I feel like we have a lot to discuss. So thank you all for listening.